Hey, and welcome to another edition of um, New Dalit MMT, uh, where I'm continuing to read from the book you see on your screen. Um, and I'm on chapter 14, uh, the macroeconomic demand for labor. Now, again, I believe this is the MMT version of macroeconomics, which seems to me like it has been getting about 90% of things right. Uh, anyway, so on 14.1, uh, this would be page 204, I believe. Uh, in this chapter, we build on Keynes' derivation of the point of effective demand discussed in chapter 13 to, to derive formally the macroeconomic demand for labor by considering the impact of changes to the money wage on the aggregate demand, or capital D, and then aggregate supp supply, which is capital Z. This analysis generates a schedule relating employment to the level of the money wage and replaces the flawed classical marginal productivity theory, which fails to recognize the interdependency of aggregate supply and demand schedules. The, macro the macroeconomic demand is then just, this is one where I can ne I almost never get, juxtaposed against a schedule depict depicting for a macroeconomic supply. Uh, 14.2, the macroeconomic demand for labor curve. Back to 14.2, the macroeconomic demand for labor curve on page 205. The interdependency of aggregate supply and demand. There's a reminder box here. Recall the uh, recall the classical employment theory considered unemployment beyond fr uh, frictional levels to be re the result of the real wage being higher than the uh, equilibrium level associated with labor demand equaling uh, be labor supply. Classical theorists conclude that the flexibility of money wages and hence real wages would continuously clear the labor market and maintain full employment. In the classical approach, given that profit-maximizing firms are assumed to be constrained by diminishing marginal productivity of labor, they will only employ more workers if the real wage, uh, if the real wage falls because each additional worker hired is less productive than the uh, last. Profit maximizer requires that the real wage, the cost of additional unit of labor, be equated with the marginal product, the contribution to output of the last unit of labor. When money wages fall, the marginal cost of production falls, uh, assuming productivity is unchanged, and firms outline supply curve shifts out, that is, they are prepared to supply more of each price level because their marginal costs are lower. Classical theory considered the aggregate supply curve to be the sum of the industry curve uh, supply curves, which in turn were considered to be aggregates of the firm's supply curves. As a result, when money wages fell, the supply curves of firms in industry and all industries would shift outwards. In the classical system, a money wage cut leads to an expansion of output because firms are prepared to hire more workers and to supply more output at the given price level. Keynes rejected this reasoning, which required that the aggregate supply curve, the sum of all the firm supply curves, shifts out as, mon as money wages fall and traces at a path of, about, of a long and uh, a path uh, along a okay along a fixed aggregate demand curve, which is considered to be independent of the aggregate supply curve. We considered this model to, in terms of the theory of effective demand outlined in chapter thirteen. The basic reason for Keynes' re rejection of this argument was that he believed that a curve in money wages would impact negatively on total spending. Once again, this is an example where specifics, uh, where specific to general reasoning provides the wrong answer. 
what might apply at the single firm or even industry level does not necessarily apply at the aggregate level. That is the basis of the fallacy of composition, which we explain in the context of the paradox of shift, oh, paradox of thrift, excuse me, in chapter two. At the individual firm level, the output supply curve would shift out, meaning you would be prepared to supply more output at each price level. After it cut the money wage of its workers, the firm would not expect a shift in the demand for its product as a result of the money wage cut, but would expect to sell more output due to the ch uh, changing uh, a lower price. But what if all firms cut money wages? The classical theory of employment focuses on only one aspect of money wage and, and that that they were a cost of production and influenced the supply chain of the economy. However, Keynes noted that money wages are also a significant component of a worker's income and by aggregate, aggregation, national income. Given that consumption spending is a, is a direct tie, is directly tied to national income, and investment spending is also likely to fall if consumption spending fell. If consumption spending fell, didn't make sense to me at first, because uh, I forgot the if. Uh, Keynes argued that the demand curves at the at the firm, industry, and aggregate level would shift un inwards. Spending at a, each price level would be lower after a money wage cut. While the firms, while firms might enjoy lower unit costs, they also face declining demand for all goods in general, because the loss income resulting from economic wide wage, money wage cut would be significant. This insight suggests that the output demand and supply curves are interdependent. This interdependency uh, also negates the classical con construction of the aggregate marginal uh, productivity curve as the macroeconomic demand curve for labor. In classical uh, employment theory and money wage cut indicated that the labor supply curve has shifted out, leads, us, uh, leads to a movement during a fixed marginal productivity curve if the price level is constant or falls by less than, less than money wages. Guys, there we go. Uh, money wages, however, uh, as once we recognize the interdependency between the demand and the and supply sides, it is clear that the marginal product product curve does not pr represent the demand schedule for labor. In chapter thirteen, we outline Keynes' model of employment. We showed that the point of the nominal effective demand in is found at the intersection of the aggregate demand and aggregate supply price curves. At each point on uh, the aggregate supply, pr uh, supply price curves, or Z, the revenue required to indu uh, induce that amount of employment should be uh, sufficient to cover all production costs and desired profits at the relevant employment level. So moving up a so moving up a given Z function move, uh, means the firms will be employing more workers and producing more output and gener uh, generating more income. The aggregate demand price or capital D uh, functions describes how much expected demand there will be in the economy at different employment and implied. Uh, income levels. We assume that the money wage is fixed along any given D function. Thus, as employment rises, total national income rises and expected, uh, expected spending also rises accordingly. The intersection between aggregate demand and aggregate supply, which defines the point of effective demand, will thus depend on the magnitude of the prevailing money wage. This, in turn, sets the level of employment that firms will offer and the level of output and national income expected to be generated by the economy. The point of effective demand occurs where all, uh, where all individual firms are employing the amount of labor they think they need to produce the amount of output they, are, they, are, they expect to sell. In section 13.4, uh, we saw that changes in money wages influenced the point of effective demand by shifting 
both Z and the D curves in Keynes' model of employment, which recognized the interdependency of the two schedules. This observation provides the clue to derive a macroeconomic labor demand curve. Next section is money, wage changes, and shifts in effective demand. Figure 14.1 illustrates the case pr proposed by the classical economist. Figure 14.1a shows the family of capital D and capital Z functions for different money wage levels. Capital W, uh, which has a uh, underscore zero two, I think, uh, capital W uh, one and, and capital W two with uh, capital W zero is uh, lesser than uh, capital W1, uh, lesser than capital, capital W2. Hence, we can see the points of effective demand corresponding to different money wages. For example, at money wage and uh, W, uh, O, the uh, aggregate demand, uh, D, which is uh, capital W, O, and aggregate supply, which is capital Z with capital W, O, jointly determine the point of effective demand which corresponds to employment capital n and figure 14.1b employment is plotted against money wages so capital n with the underlying zero re represents the macroeconomic labor uh, uh, demand correspondence to money wage level which is a uh, cap uh, capital w with a zero as shown in figure 14.1a, at each employment level, a raise in the money wage above or above W0 uh, will push the capital Z function up against firms now require more sales revenue to sustain the same employment and output levels to satisfy their profit exp uh, exp expectations. There we go. But the higher money wages also mean that at each employment level, incomes are higher, and this raises the revenue expected at that level. The capital D curve shows out. Uh, therefore, the capital D function shifts up when the money wage rises and shifts down if money wages are cut. We can draw a family of uh, aggregate D and Z functions and identify correspondent points of effective demand for demand and aggregate, and aggregate employment. And each point of effective demand yields a money, wage, and employment combination, which is a point on the macroeconomic labor demand function, as shown above, uh, shown in uh, Figure fourteen point one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I can't really describe what fourteen point one is. You'll have to get the book for that. Anyway, so let's see. What was I at? That's B, by the way. Yeah, fourteen point one B. Under classical theory, the marginal uh, productivity uh, function defines the macroeconomic labor uh, demand function without reference to the goods and services market. In contrast, the capital D uh, through capital Z framework, we need to know the point of effective demand correspondence to each money wage to, to determine the quantity of employment offered. Uh, we now need to consider whether there is a particular re relationship between wages and employment. If the money wage changes, three different scenarios can be identified. The function shifts by less than the uh, less than the zero function, and thus employment rises uh, falls rise uh, rises when the money wage rises falls. There are equi uh, equivalent shifts in the capital D and capital Z functions, and employment does not change. The capital D functions shift by more than the, the capital Z function, and thus employment rises or falls when the money wage rises or falls. And, oh, sorry. Yeah, when the money wage uh, rises or falls. There we go. Okay, so in 1956, American economist Sidney uh, Raintraub, Raintraub said that the first possibility was consistent with the traditional argument that when money wages rise, employment falls. He called this the classical case, which reflects the position or proposition rather in classical employment theory that unemployment can be eliminated by cutting money wages. 
Figure 14.1 depicts the classical case showing the family of D and Z functions very uh, for different money wage levels and the correspondent, corresponding employment rates. The function uh, shift tor of uh, uh, function uh, the Z function, excuse me, shifts upwards by more than D function shifts at the as the money wage. Uh, rates rise. The points of effective demand, as shown by the effective demand line, yield a downward sloping macroeconomic down, uh, demand for labor curve, which demonstrates the ver the relationship between money, wages, and employment. <coughs> Excuse me. Keynes attacked the classical employment theory because he did not believe that employment was particularly sensitive to money wage movements. In terms of the three scenarios for the relative movements in the D and the Z function, Keynes' uh, position corresponds to the second option, namely that the two functions shift e uh, equivalently. And uh, 14.4 captures the situation which uh, Wintrub uh, characterized as a key, uh, Keynesian case. You will see that the under uh, you will see that under these assumptions, the macroeconomic demand curve for labor is vertical and invariant to movements in money wages. The third option that the capital D function shifts by more than the uh, the Z function when the money wage changes was referred to by Wintrop as the under consumptionist case. Some economic economists believe that higher money wages would stimulate employment because of the rise in consumption. Uh, the figure 14.3 depicts the underconsumption uh, underconsumptionist case. Case a note for the simplicity: lineage or lineage, excuse me, linear curves are used in uh, figures 14.1, 14.2, and 14.3. Uh, Wintrub uh, said in relation to these three cases that from the uh, standpoint of economic policy, their implications are vastly different. If, for example, the real world was more like the Keynesian or the under-consumptionist case than trying to curb or cur or cure excuse me, unemployment by cutting money wages would fail, and in the under-consumptionist case would be a disaster for employment. Uh, Wintraub considered the real, way, uh, real world was more like that depicted in 14.4, which is what we call a general, generalized macroeconomic demand curve for labor with three distinctive segments. The blue arrow signifies the employment and is a the employment is a function of effective demand, which is determined outside of the labor market. With that said, be right back. Uh, welcome back. Uh, we are on um, chapter 14, uh, page 210, and uh, title is National Income Output and Employment Determination. Uh, what I'll try to do is actually try to publish at the, the figures on, on, at some point uh, during this whole endeavor. Uh, pretty much, I'll, probably, I'll probably put like a, a montage of sorts together and see how that goes. Uh, anyway. So uh, focusing on the so, uh, solid blue line, the interpretation is that when money wages rise above W or two, uh, W2, uh, further rises in the money wage induced employment, which the classical, which is the classical case. This would rise above uh, because aggregate demand or Z was shifted upwards faster than aggregate demand D. How might we explain that uh, at a higher money wages, which might be associated with a higher price level, uh, fiscal and monetary policy might be tightened to head off an inflationary spiral. 
The resulting negative impact on aggregate demand is likely to reduce the point of effective demand below the previous employment level or N or couple N, corresponding to wage couple W. Uh, further, in an open economy, very high wages might reduce international competitiveness and imp impinge on impinge or impinge, yeah, on uh, export demand, which will also have a negative impact on aggregate demand and shift the point of effective demand to the level of its current position in 14.4. It is highly probable that the negative slope under segment would be beyond the range defined by normal wage movements and level or levels. Thus, it is a logical possibility that would that would be rarely encountered. Note that the classical shape is not uh, is not generated by the dynamics that the classical system specified adjustment up. Uh, a marginal productivity schedule. However, the shape gives the same result, higher money wages reduce employment. <coughs> when money wages are below W or capital W, it is possible that the uh, PIGU effect, uh, P-I-G-O-U effect, would come to play, come, come into play. This phenomenon, which was named after British economist author uh, Pigu uh, is also referred to more generally as the real uh, the real balance effect or the wealth effect. When Keynes attacked the classical employment theory, he noted that cutting may, uh, money wages would not be likely to lead to a fall in real wages because competition would also drive prices down, given that firms now enjoy lower unit costs and assumption, assuming Productivity did not fall due to the low morale brought about by the money wage decline. In the 1930s, the classical economists who had recommended money wage cuts as the way to engineer the real wage cuts considered necessary to restore labor market equilibrium were forced to acknowledge that uh, forced to acknowledge, albeit reluctantly, that if money wages were cut and prices followed the cost reductions, then the real wages might not uh, fall at all. It was possible that the real wage would or could even rise if the fall in money wages was less than the fall in prices. However, Arthur Pigas, or Pigga, uh, responded in the famous 1943 article with a proposed solution to the problem of the economy being stuck in an unemployment uh, impasse. He argued that real consumption spending was also a positive function of the stock of the real wealth that individuals possessed. This wealth was hidden or held in nominal terms and the form of money, balances, and other financial assets such as government bonds. Thus, even if a fall in money wage, which is leads to an equivalent, uh, equivalent uh, a per, uh, percentage fall in the price level, leaving the real wages unchanged, the lower wage prices would increase the real wealth of all those who were holding nominal wealth balances so all wealth uh, wealth holders would uh, feel richer and it was argued would thus increase real consumption at a level of income the increase in real balances at lower prices thus gave proponents of the classical uh, employment theory another uh, conduit uh, through which money wage falls could stimulate employment if w real wages did not move, in other words, the un uh, inverse relationship between money wages and employment was restored by its real balance effect. It was point uh, pointed out, however, that borrowers would, would feel poorer when prices fell because the real value of their debt burden would rise. And using the same logic, this would lead to a reduction in real consumption at each level of income. Uh, to some extent, this would have offset any stimulus to spending that the debt holders might contribute. If most of the debt was in the form of government bonds, then the net effect of falling wages would probably be larger than if wealth were held in the form of private debt. Thus, when money wages uh, are very low, uh, Winthrop uh, wrote that those owning pennies become millionaires. Uh, uh, 
calamitous prospect. Full employment may well be assured. In the real world, if prices fell so low that a real balance effect of any significant size was generated, then it is likely that the entire banking system would collapse. The real the, the reason is that while the nominal liabilities held by the banks, many of which would be loans to households and firms, would not be altered, their real values would rise by so much as to bankrupt most of their borrowers. The mass defaults would in turn cripple the financial system. <clears throat> the empirical evidence is that in normal price movement ranges uh, ranges that uh, ranges the measured real balance or wealth effect is very small and clearly insufficient to remedy a major shortfall in aggregate demand. So while the again did you pick up some of that effect presented a logical uh, possibility, it does not provide the classical employment theory with the support is required to not. Uh, negate the damaging critique made by Keynes. Money wage um, money wage rates between uh, capital W and capital W2, the nominal range uh, is, uh, in, sorry, the nominal range in figure 14.4 are likely to lead to no change in the point of effective demand and thus the macroeconomic demand curve for labor would be vertical. For employment to change, there must be a change in the level of effective demand. The vertical segment could also positively slope into, uh, if there was evidence of an un, uh, under-consumptionist response in a uh, normal range of money wage movements. It is possible, for example, in poorer nations that the demand boost from a money wage right, rate rise will outstrip the supply response arising from the extra production cost. As a consequence, the slope of the macroeconomic demand curve for labor in, in this relative range will be positively sloped as depicted in 14.3. 14.3, the determination of employment and the existence of involuntary unemployment. We are now able to complete our analysis of the labor market in the macroeconomic by reference to the both the demand and supply side sides of the labor market. Figure 14.45 excuse me, shows the Keynesian labor supply function, which is a function of the money wage. The function tells us that at the prevailing money wage uh, rate or W or capital W workers will be uh, will be willing to supply labor up to the full employment level of N or capital N, but all but after that point they, they will damage higher wages to work extended hours and so on. A change in price expectations would lead to shift uh, shifts in the, in this function. <clears throat> the vertical black line denoted full employment coincides with the employment level in which everyone desire who desires a job can find can find, can find one at the prevailing money wage. Rate. The thicker black line is the macroeconomic demand curve for labor and has backward uh, has has backward and forward bending sections at extreme level or wage levels and a and a vertical section at normal wage levels. Involuntary unemployment occurs when the current macroeconomic demand for labor is less than the full employment level. Mass unemployment is the economic uh, econ is oh sorry, mass unemployment in the economy is thus determined by the sta state of effective demand rather than being caused by the ascriptive characteristics of the unemployed themselves. The unemployed become powerless to improve their pros prospect because the shortage of jobs is caused by a systemic failure of aggregate demand relative to aggregate supply. In Figure Twenty Point Five, the level of invol involuntary employment, uh, unemployment, excuse me, at this at this level of effective not, uh, de damn, effective demand is measured by the distance uh, couple n full and minus couple n zero. The lesson that Keynes taught us was that an at an unchanged wage rate, uh, rate a demand stimulus in the goods and service market, which shifts the macroeconomic demand curve for labor outwards towards full employment would not only stimulate employment, it would 
at that same time reduce unemployment without any change in the money wage or price level being required. The, this mechanism has been denied by the classical theory of employment. Mass unemployment is always driven by insufficient effective demand and the policy prescription is straightforward. For a given level of non-government uh, non spe spending, consumption, investment, and net exports, mass unemployment arises because the government spending is too low or taxes are too high. In the event of non-government spending being too low, the, occur the current cure for mass unemployment is to expand government spending and or tax cuts to raise aggregate demand. Okay, so box 14.1, the tale of 100 dogs and 95 bones. I've heard this, but I don't think I've actually, I don't think this actually made sense to me until now. Uh, who knows? Imagine a small community comprising 100 dogs. Each morning they set off, uh, they set off into the field to dig up bones, dig up for bones. If there are enough bones for all the buried, uh, for all buried in the field, then all the dogs can succeed in their search. Now imagine that one day the 100 dogs set off for the field as a usual, but this time they find there are only 95 bones buried. Some dogs were, who were always very skilled at finding bones might dig up two bones and others will dig up the usual one bone. But as a matter of accounting, at least five dogs will return home boneless. Now imagine that the government decides that this is a unsustainable and decides that it is the skills and motivation of the boneless dogs that is the problem. They're not skilled. They're they are not skilled or motivated enough. Thus, if the problem were to be constructed to be an individual one, then and, and then an individual solution would be appropriate. So a range of dog psychologists and dog trainers might be called in to work on the attitudes and skills of the boneless dogs. The dogs undergo assessment and are assigned to case managers. They are told that, you, that unless they train, they will miss out on their nightly bowl of food that the government provides, them to them, provides to them when boneless, they feel despondent. After running and digging skills are imparted to the boneless dogs, things things start to change. While the training helps some dog and some dogs improve their luck as fighting bones, others turn turn up boneless. All the training does is to shuffle the queue. Oh, yeah, queue always leaving at least five dogs without bones. No amount of training and motivational speeches can resolve the problem. The only solution is to provide more bones. The point is that when there are insufficient jobs available in the economy, the unemployed are powerless to redress the, that shortage no matter how hard they search. Supply-side programs, some concentrating on the motivation of skill or skills of the employed, unemployed, me, will I'll only shuffle the jobless queue in a situation of job shortage. This was an important lesson that governments le learned in the 1930s as a result of the work of Keynes and others. The classical theory of employment distracted as policymakers from seeing that the fundamental solution to unemployment was to increase aggregate demand relative, relative to the aggregate supply. As a consequence, in the early years of the Great Depression, millions of workers lost their jobs as the government tried to implement the wage-cutting solution proposed by the dominant classical viewpoint. It was, all, it was only when the government expanded the deficits that the Great Depression came to an end. 14.4. A classical resurgence thwarted. The fallacy inherent in the classical faith in wage and price adjustments was first noted by Karl Marx in his Theory of Surplus Value, where he discussed the problem of realization of sales when there is unemployment. He was first to understand that the notion of effective demand he made the distinction between a notion, uh, a notional demand um, for a good uh, or desire, and an effective demand, one that is ba is backed with ability to pay. It is obvious that the unemployed want want to consume more, but because they have no or little income, they uh, can. They can wait a minute. No, they cannot translate their notional desires into effective spending. 
Accordingly, the market which relies on consumers entering shops with money to purchase goods and services fails to receive any demand signal from the unemployed, and so firms cannot respond with higher production. This distinction between notional and effective demand was at the heart of the Keynes and classical debate during the Great Depression. It is central to Keynes' attack on Say's Law, which claimed that supply creates its own demand. As we have learned, Say's Law denies there can ever be overproduction and underemployment. If consumers decide to save more, then the firms react to this and produce more investments, investment goods to absorb the saving. There is more is total is there is total fluidity fluidity needs me to say uh, resources between sectors and workers are simply shifted from making uh, say iPads to making investment goods. Keynes showed that when people save, they do not spend. Further, they give no signal to the firms about whether or when excuse me, they will spend in the future and what they will buy then. So there is a market failure. Firms react to the rising inventories and cut back output, unable, unable to deal with the uncertainty. There was a there was a theoretical push to reassert Say's law using the real balance effect as the con conduit by which aggregate demand would always adjust to a accurate supply in the 1950s. But major theoretical work by Keynesians, such as Rob Clower uh, and Axel, ooh, I'll try to pronounce his name, Lejeune, uh Hoof Bud uh, provided new insights into how we can see the con uh, the uh, contribution of Keynes and his demolition of classical theory. These two authors demonstrated in different ways how neoclassical models of optimi optimizing behavior were flawed when applied to macroeconomic issue issues such as mass unemployment. Clower uh, showed that an excessive or excess supply in the labor market on un unemployment was not usually accompanied by excess demand elsewhere in the economy, especially in the product market. Excess demands are expressed in money terms. How, can, how could an unemployed worker who has notion or, or lean product, product demands Signal to an employer, a seller in the produ uh, product market, their demand int intentions, not via saving in uh, financial terms, such as holding money and other liquid asset uh, financial assets. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, but try this again. Uh, Louis Jean Hoof Bud uh, also noted that involuntary unemployment arises because there is no way that the unemployed uh, workers can signal that there could or they would buy more goods and services if they were to be employed. A particular firm cannot assume that profits will rise if they hire another worker, even though revenue in general will clearly rise because there will be higher incomes and higher demand. The market signaling process thus breaks down and the economy stagnates. Only if the additional workers hired were quantity, quantity excuse me, guaranteed to buy the firm's extra output could be firm go forward. No, could the firm go forward to hire them? Because only in that case could the firm be sure or be sure that the cost of hiring the workers would be covered by additional sales revenue. Conclusion. Uh, one of the key elements of Keynes' attacks and his ultimate discrediting of the classical employment theory was his identification of what we call the fallacy of composition. <clears throat> we discussed this concept in Chapter 2. Prior to the 1930s, there were no separate study called macroeconomics. The dominant theory of the day, uh, characterized by the Treasury view, considered macroeconomics to be an exercise in aggregation of individual relationships. The economy was thus seen as being just like a household or single firm, only bigger. Accordingly, changes, uh, changes in behavior or circumstances that might benefit the individual or the firm were automatically claimed to be a benefit to the overall economy. 
the uh, insistence in the Treasury view would, that wage cuts would cure the mass unemployment has uh, that arose during the 1930s Great Depression symbolized the fact that their reasoning was based on con compositional fallacies. Keynes led the attack on the mainstream by exposing several fallacies of a composition, while these types of logical errors pervade mainstream ma macroeconomic thinking, there are two famous fallacies of composition in the macroeconomics. A, the paradox of thrift, and B, the wage-cutting solution is un to unemployment. Our discussion of the macroeconomic demand for labor curve in this chapter also highlights uh, how classical employment theory was better followed <laughs> by, the, by this problem. Using much words that I don't know, or at least I have a hard time pronouncing. Uh, we have considered the Keynes versus classic uh, classics debate in some detail in chapter 13, oh, I'm sorry, chapter 12 through the 14, because the same ideas are a dispute in the current era. Let's see. The mainstream response to the persistence uh, of uh, persistent unemployment that has belligerent most econ economies for the last three or four more three or more decades is the is to invoke supply side measures wage cutting structure activity tests for welfare entitlements relentless training programs but the policy approach they which reflects an uh, emphasis on the labor market and particularly the wage rate falls foul and fallacy of composition problem Policymakers consistently mistake a systemic failure for individual failure. The main reason that the supply side approach is flawed is that it fails to recognize that unemployment arises when there are not enough jobs created to match the desire to work of the willing labor supply that requires a system-wide policy response to increase effective demand rather than an individual solution focusing on the characteristics of the unemployed. The <sighs> main problem I have been seeing recently, and that's from pretty much anybody that, that believes in the regular mainstream, is they keep talking about money printing. There is no such thing as money printing anymore anyway. Uh, the only money printing that there is anything is the Treasury printing out more cash. But that does not go into the general economy. That goes into the Federal Reserve for, you know, in case uh, banks need reserves to be to be held at their banks. That's, you know, for different other transfers, stuff of that nature. It's not, you know, the government uh, spending into the economy through uh, printing money. Um I mean, when the when the Congress spends, that spending is fresh money. That that is new money. So I mean, there has been a lot of that. There has there's been more uh, tax breaks, which isn't uh, fundamentally printing money. It's letting those who had the money keep the money for other reasons. Uh, in some cases, is to expand their already um, expanding empires. For other times, it's uh, for like say giving them uh campaign contributions or it's to put more money into their own uh, stocks their own bonds stuff of that nature so it's money that they keep but to the irs it's still uh it's still an expenditure because that money is not going into the government for for non-government spending because taxes don't pay for anything taxes are it's basically it's basically a recycled a recycled uh, economy, really, because when the, and at least in my view, from what I've been learning as far as the part goes, uh, when the government spends money into the economy, the taxes is basically like what we do with, say, cardboard or whatever else. Uh, you can you kind of consider the IRS like the place where you put the cardboard, or plastic, and other things like that. It's recycling money back into uh, out of the economy and. Pretty much using it for nothing else. It's, you know, it's it's not being used for anything. It's like thank you and kind of putting the pile over here. It's, it's a liability that the government put out. We used within our, our economy. They took it out through taxes. Now after that is disposed of. Period. I mean that's the reason why uh, the like certain um, 
certain uh, places that hold actual cash money, they they literally will either burn it or they will shred it because it's money that's no longer in the economy. They've taken it out through taxes and what and other things. Anyway, so and MMT is not the reason for uh, other countries having a problem as far as economics. It's Say, for instance, in in the, the African nations, it's the fact they didn't know how to grow uh, grow uh, items such as like tomatoes, carrots, you know, pretty much agriculture. Uh, because they didn't know how to grow that, their economy was down to cook puts because a, a summer country, if they had the raw material, if they do not have an outside debt, you know, in a debt that's outside the currency, and all uh, money uh, or all obligations, liabilities can be, uh, are paid in that same currency that, that that country controls, like us. Then there is no debt problem in regards to that. Anyway, uh, so yeah, uh, whatever we need as far as a green new deal, uh, jobs guarantee. Uh, Medicare for all, all of that stuff is affordable, deflationary, and it will keep us safer as a nation. It will keep this planet going, uh, even though we're about eight years away from not told. I don't think it's total destruction, but uh, it's soon to be unstable for life. Uh, you know, next say I don't know how many years. I'm not. Uh, I'm not equal like that, in regards to my knowledge. But what I do know is. In certain areas of seasons, seasons are supposed to be cold, not hot. Uh, when seasons are supposed to be hot, not cold, you know, is reverse. That's climate change. Um, when you're when food prices are going up because crops are being are being burned uh, because of too much because the the sun is hotter than it had been in the past, that creates a shortage of say vegetables, fruits. Um, grains and stuff like that. Then you have a freaking war because we need to show how big our dicks is, dicks are. We don't need to show anything in regards to that. It's it's all ego. We need to put away the egos and set aside the knowledge to be able to help this country become better instead of worse. Uh, the people need to rise up in whatever way they feel comfortable in doing. I am not um, suggesting they go to violence, but if they're pushed to it, I can't control them. Anyway, thanks for listening. Uh, talk to you tomorrow. Peace out for now. Learn MMT. Do not listen to the mainstream idiots. They don't know anything. <clears throat> Basically do the opposite of what they always tell you. Peace out for now.